Good evening, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Portland Civic Education Program about Immigration. My name is Marion McNamara, Civic Education Chair. The League is dedicated to empowering voters and defending democracy. We believe democracy functions best when voters are informed about issues and engaged in their communities. To that end, we present these educational programs that are free and open to the public to help citizens learn about the issues that affect their lives. I would like to thank our moderator for the evening, Nim Shutu, and our panelists, Erin McKee of the Oregon Justice Resource Center, Shapan Sinlapase of the law firm of Miranda Sinlapase, Leland Baxter Neal, the ACLU of Oregon, and Polo Catalani, managing attorney for Northwest Communities Council. At this time, I would like to thank the Multnomah County Bar Foundation and the Carol and Selma Sailing Foundation for their generous financial support. Thanks to Multnomah County for supplying this venue, and thanks to our media partner, Metro East Media, for recording these programs. And finally, thanks to all of our League volunteers. Our moderator for this evening's discussion is Nim Shutu. Nim emigrated from Thailand in 1986. Today she's an arts community organizer and is beginning to be a community health organizer. She was trained by the Center for International Organization. She has a decade of bringing together diverse communities through the fine arts and performing arts. She's experienced as a cross-cultural conciliator. And we are grateful for her expertise and experience as we explore the topic of immigration, welcomes, walls, sanctuaries, and borders. Thank you so much, Marion. Um, so Adika, and this is, <laughs> I think no, some of you know this, a good evening and welcome. Um, the opening for this evening's program will be a short presentation we call Indonesian um, by one of our panelists, Polo Catalani, after which I will introduce the rest of our panel. Yes. Um, before I do my uh, Kebati Krochong um, um, Jatung, uh, uh, which will be an, a, um, a prayer of gratitude for our elders and our ancestors. I believe most everybody in this room's elders and ancestors. Before we do that, though, as a new American, it's uh, my duty to thank 130 centuries of Native America for handing this beautiful, this blessed corner of this grand continent to us to care for. These are folks who handed this soil to us so rich, it's like chocolate. You know, you throw something out your kitchen window and it grows into food. And these rivers full of fish in this grand cycle of life that we are so, so uh, blessed uh, to inherit from them. And we promise them as new Americans uh, that seven generations forward from now, it will be as beautiful as when we came. So we thank the uh, tribes, the elders, the ancestors of this soil. But now let me uh, do my jatung uh, for you. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Families move. Sorry, we are not quite so cool as we think we are. Ah, families move. Families move. We've always moved since memory began. Humans move like gray whale families move, like Arctic caribou, like Chapman Elementary chimney swifts move. It's imprinted in cestacea ribs, big as a school bus, in birdie bones, light as a feather. When whale families move, hushed OSU scientists follow every breath blowing just above our cold Pacific's waves. Caribou migrating have inspired America's kindest conservationists to chill the world's biggest oil men. 
Every September, hundreds of families on cozy blankets cheer Chapman Elementary Swifts. Thousands and thousands spew out of that school's tall stack, chattering in a mix of English and Spanish, eager to get down to sunnier Mexico. Bigger bugs, too. All ambitious families move across our Earth's well-worn face. Take our president's pup, moving from Kisuma to Manoa for school. Take Barack's mom, moving him to Java for love. Take him moving to LA, then New York, then Chicago, then Washington, DC, pretty baby girls in tow. Our elder aunties have a saying back home, good boys and real men make their moms and wives proud. Only our lazy and our stupid sons stay home in our poor kampong, in our village. This saying has moved with me familia in an almost complete circumnavigation of our marvelous blue marble. We have all always moved. And yet many Portlanders are fonder of fins and feathers moving than of other folk moving among us. Portland's planners are easily the West's very best. Tidy Max leaves hardly a trace of carbon in her swift wake. Our green roofs carefully return rain to ground to river to ocean. We revere River Columbia's cycles of sockeye and steelhead, the intricate weave of our interdependent lives. But not enough of you and me figure into our region's health, our grand circulatory system of human migration. We move as naturally and perennially as all life moves. It's in these bones, borders. Borders are not. Borders we declare by law. Borders we pencil on recyclable paper. Salem city limits used to determine where black men could not sleep at night. Multnomah County lines used to stop cold sheriff's boy's pursuit of bad guys. Oregon's border used to map where Filipinos could marry white ladies from where we could not. Where Chinese could own laundries, where white men could own slaves. While these jurisdictional lines are national borders hardened, Four generations of excluding and expelling families migrating north of folk steaming east have left America oddly homogenous and mean. And some of our leaders build our futures as if us moving is different from what Swifts and what Salmon do. As if what drives familias to do what we have always done is somehow distinct from what rain and rivers and oceans have always done in irresistible cycles, naturally. South to north, east to west, back again, perennially, beautifully. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for such a touching uh, talking stories. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little out of sync. <laughs> so I would like to introduce you, um, Polo. Uh, mm. he's, he's an attorney, an author, and a newcomer community elder. His undergrad and graduate research focus on human migrations in East Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. He is a Howard University R.S. Smith Committee Law Fellow and an Oregon Literary Arts Stanford Fellow. Polo is managing attorney of Northwest Community Councils, whose, whose work has been featured on um, PBS, Imagine America, and on religion and ethics, as well as in other national and regional media. He is the author of Culture, Culture, Immigrant Stories from Portland Cafe Counters and the upcoming books, Thousand Promises. And um, other panelists today, I'm so, I'm so honored to, to, to introduce um, our panel today. Erin um, McGee, She's a co-founder of the Oregon Justice Resource Center. Erin is an immigration attorney who believes we are all in this together. In her practice, he has represented individuals fleeing persecution, family seeking to reunite, and immigrants accused of crimes, among others. As a young intern at a feminist human rights NGO in India, 
She asked her mentor if she could stay and continue the work. She was politely told to go home and fix her own country. Erin is driven by the belief that justice system should be accountable to all of us and that we should be accountable to each other regardless of borders. And the next um, speaker is Leland Baxter Neal. He's an immigration law specialist at ACLU, Oregon, and a graduate of the Lewis and Clark Law School. He hit the ground running at ACLU and was instrumental in the successful fight for immigrants detainees at the Sheridan Federal Prison to get access to lawyers. Before joining the ACLU, Leland worked at Immigrants Defense Oregon, representing people in deportation proceedings and working with unaccompanied minors held in the secure detention facility. I'm shaking reading this <laughs> because, um, you know, all these problem, you know, immigrants have to encounter, so. And the last person on the list, my sister, um, the person who, you know, in the Asian community will call, you know, when we have any problem. So, Shanpon Silapasite is a partner in the law firm Miranda's Silapasite. She represents clients on general immigration law matters and focuses her practice on assisting children who are survivors of domestic violence, serious crime, and human trafficking. She works on the local, state, and national levels to build bridges between vulnerable community members and the criminal justice system. Shanpon was the recipient of the 2016 Women of Achievement Awards from the Oregon Commission for Women, who described her as a fearless advocate for the rights of immigrants and refugees, and I confirm that. <laughs> Shanpon has confirmed knowledge of the challenges faced when coming to a new country as her family settled Resettle in the United States as refugees from Laos in 1980s. Tonight's discussions will touch on some of the complicated thoughts and emotions that has been in the national and local headlines this year. Our panelists will begin by introducing their work and experience with immigration, touching on the themes of this evening, welcomes, wall, sanctuaries, and borders. After all the speakers have finished their opening remarks, they will have a chance to comment or question each other. And I may have some ad additional questions and of course um, the written questions by audience members. We encourage audience members to write questions for the speakers on the index cards that are being distributed. League members will be collecting the cards throughout the presentation, and I will post the questions. Our first speaker today will be Erin McGee of the Oregon Justice Resource Center. Thank you, Nim. <clears throat> and thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting this really fabulous panel together. I, I know um, and adore all my colleagues at the table, so I think we're gonna have a great discussion. So the, you know, the topic of immigration justice is really broad. Um, I'm going to talk about what we do at our organization um, and how we strive to make immigration justice a reality. So at the Immigrant Rights Project, we work specifically at the intersection of criminal law and immigration law, something that has come to be called crimigration. Right? In the narrowest sense, and what our daily work consists of, crimigration involves um, analyzing the immigration consequences of pleas and convictions. And we are actually funded by the state of Oregon to provide the service to public defense providers. Um, so props to Oregon for being one of the states that does that. 
Um, and they do that because in 2010, the Supreme Court found that the failure to give this advice uh, violated a defendant's Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel. That's how important it is. This advice is critical because seemingly minor offenses can have devastating consequences. For example, I once had a client who entered the United States as a refugee from Iraq, and she later obtained her green card. And then one day she was at the store, and she was um, buying some hair barrettes for her granddaughter, and she was standing in line at the register waiting to pay when she got a phone call. And the phone call was telling her that um, her son in Iraq had just died in a car bombing. And she was understandably um, in shock and devastated, and without even thinking, she walked out of the store with the bread still in her hand. Security stopped her, they called the police, and she was charged with theft. Right? She was so ashamed of having been arrested that she just pled very quickly to get it over with, not realizing that that petty theft conviction actually made her deportable from the United States. So by the time she came to me, she wanted to apply for naturalization, she wanted to become a US citizen. In her case, we were fortunate uh, to persuade the government not to place her into removal proceedings, but to exercise discretion favorably and grant her citizenship. Um, and it was a big win for her, it was a good day. But that was several years ago, and I, I don't, I'm not sure that it would have the same outcome today. In a very broad sense, crimmigration refers to uh, the criminalization of migration itself, increased immigration, detention, and use of private prisons, criminal prosecution, and subsequent family separation at the border, and a deportation process that, that one immigration judge compared to holding death penalty cases in a traffic court setting. Um, and I think that's an accurate description. Um, for someone, for an immigrant who is undocumented in the United States, um, who's lived here for a long time, I think the most common trigger for removal or deportation proceedings is usually some kind of adverse or negative contact with law local law enforcement. Again, even if it's for a minor offense. Um, and so this is really where we do our core work. And it's around these issues that we, um, kind of focus our goals for immigrant justice, right, and, and sanctuary. We'll get to that later. Um, we do our work on three different levels, on an individual level, um, as well as our top priority, making sure we're giving good advice and recommendations to people so that they can preserve their immigration options and meet their individual goals. On an institutional level, we push back on unreasonable laws and policies. We work on progressive legislation. We write amicus briefs. Um, we work on campaigns, um, like with the ACLU, and the uh, recently successful No on 105, maintaining Oregon's quote unquote sanctuary statute. Um, and then we also do communications and public education. And this part is very challenging for us. Um, it's challenging because many folks find it difficult. Um, you know, we don't serve a, a population that traditionally has been very popular or gets a lot of sympathy, non-citizens, immigrants who have been accused of crimes. Um, and we find that um, people can have trouble thinking about an individual in two ways, as both a criminal and an immigrant with a family and a future and a stake in our communities. Um, and too often, I think the conversation gets to be about deserving versus non-deserving immigrants. And we really push against that. You know, even Obama said about his immigration enforcement policy that it was about felons and not families. But of course, we all know that felons have families too, right? And if you judge a person by their rap sheet alone, without context, you're always going to come to incomplete and flawed conclusions about folks. And I think if we care about immigration justice, right, we need to be willing to embrace those complexities. 
And this is kind of, again, where the crux of our work comes from. OGRC, we're really a criminal justice reform organization, and we think that immigration reform is, should be part of that conversation. And I think we're starting to recognize as a society how our criminal justice system is steeped with systemic racism and institutional cultures of violence, dehuman, dehumanization, and vindictiveness. Um, but we haven't quite connected the dots to immigration enforcement and the immigration enforcement system. So all those inequities that happen in the criminal justice system, racist laws and practices, mass incarceration, overly punitive laws, abhorrent detention conditions, prison conditions, those are all just replicated and compounded in the immigration enforcement system. Um, so that's just kind of the, the narrow focus of, of what we do at OJRC and where we really see our role um, in, in working towards immigrant justice. And I'm not going to talk about sanctuary right now, um, but um, I will say congrats to the ACLU and everyone at the table who was involved on, on the recent successful campaign, and also will welcome questions on that later if it comes up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, I'm so <laughs> overwhelmed by this <laughs> as an immigrant living here for uh, for 30 years. So thank you so much, Erin, again. And for now, we're going to hear the overview of our topic from Leland Baxter Niels of the ACLU of Oregon. Good evening. Um, my name is Leland, and uh, I'm originally from Eugene, Oregon, so I grew up in, in Oregon, um, I lived, I was originally, uh, went to University of Oregon where I studied journalism and I spent um, much of my 20s living in Costa Rica and Central America, working as a newspaper reporter there. Um, I spent a bit of time in Nicaragua, which has not traditionally been a source of uh, um, asylees, but given the recent conditions in Nicaragua, um, we we're seeing a lot of folks from there. But also spent time in Guatemala and, and, and the northern area of, of Central America, which is one of the main sources for much of the, um, the asylum seekers who are fleeing violence or persecution there. Um, I moved back to Portland, uh, moved back to Oregon, moved to Portland in 2010, um, still as a journalist. And I went to work for, um, well, I applied to a job I found on Craigslist using Spanish as my keywords, and uh, it was with an attorney named Stephen Manning, who I had no idea at the time, um, but is a one of the most, I think, respected immigration attorneys in the country, and who's, um, I recently had the opportunity to be his lawyer in the Sheridan lawsuit, which I'll explain later. Um, when I first moved to Portland, I got involved in Community, as working as a legal assistant for Stephen, I got connected with a community organization. Um, it was a coalition of community organizations working to end police ICE collaboration. Um, the effort at that point was to get uh, the sheriff of Multnomah County, Dan Staten, to stop complying um, with ICE detainers. So ICE detainers were immigration's way of saying, there's someone in your custody, dear sheriff, um, who we believe might be deportable. Um, even if they post bail, you c please don't release them. We want to come and get them and, and take them away. Um, it was it's sort of at that point like one of the hot um, areas in what Aaron's talking about, this criminalization of immigration, like this deepening connection between um, immigration and the criminal justice system. And it was really sort of my entryway into immigrant rights work. Um, and my work has always sort of come back to, I shouldn't say always, my work, I have, I have continually seen that as probably one of the most critical places um, because, as Aaron talked about, um, this sort of interweaving of the criminal justice system with immigration system serves a lot of purposes. One of the main ones um, is to stigmatize immigrants um, and to place immigrants in a category of others that makes it much more easy to eliminate rights, um, fracture communities, and deport um, really masses of humanity, which is what we're seeing under Trump. I went to law school here at Lewis and Clark Law School and studied uh, criminal justice issues. I clerked at some public defender's offices as a law student. And then um, 
clerked for a judge at the State Court of Appeals, and then went to work at Immigrant Defense Oregon, um, which was an immigration project launched out of a public defender's office. So it was an opportunity to kind of work on that is on, on the issue I really cared about um, in a setting that was important to me. Um, there, I had the opportunity to represent um, minors who were termed unaccompanied minors who were being held in a secure detention facility here in Portland. Many folks don't know, but we have one of just a handful of such secure detention facilities in the country where children who are um, believed to be undocumented and whose parents aren't available to care for them, according to ICE, um, are being held. And we work to challenge their, their, their detention in one of these secure facilities. Um, Worked on a couple other projects. One was to um, try to secure free representation for um, or immigrant Oregonians who are facing removal proceedings here at Portland Immigration Court. Um, one of the things that folks who work in this area know by heart, but many folks may not, is that when you're placed in deportation proceedings, there is no guaranteed right to an attorney. So immigration law is commonly known as like the most complicated body of law, perhaps more complicated than um, the tax code. And yet someone can be deported from a country they've lived their entire lives without ever having an attorney stand behind, beside them. Not even children who can be placed in deportation proceedings are guaranteed an attorney. It has really taken um, advocacy to get children attorneys, but routinely children are deported um, without the benefit of an attorney assigned to their case. Um, so we were actually you know, lucky that Multnomah County and the city of Portland dedicated a significant amount of funding to get a pilot program launched here at Portland Immigration Court to provide attorneys to folks who don't have them. Um, that project is just getting off the ground. So I came to work at the ACLU in June. That was actually the week um, that many folks started to find out, or I guess it was the week before, that the Trump administration had placed 124 asylum seekers in the federal detention center at Sheridan Federal Prison, Oregon's only federal prison. Um, this was a part of a, uh, a movement of 1,600 asylum seekers who were arrested at the border, both at ports of entry, who had lawfully presented themselves to re request asylum, and folks who had come between ports of entry. And 1,600 of these individuals were transferred to a couple of federal prisons, one being here in Oregon. Um, that Sheridan case really highlights a lot of what um, is concerning about the current administration. And I think in the time that I have, I don't have time to get to a lot of it, to be honest. But a couple of the themes, right, um, I think one is the use of criminality to sort of strip folks of their humanity. Um, you also see really what we're seeing under Trump is an all out assault. And I wanna back up for a moment and add an additional frame to the crimmigration frame that Aaron provided, and that's one of racism. Um, many folks, you, you hear people say, well my, my ancestors, particularly us white folks, love to say, well my ancestors came here the right way. They came here, my, my parents came here, le my, my ancestors came here legally. Um, so <laughs> before the 20th century, there really was no legal restrictions on immigration to the United States by white Europeans. There, there were no laws, right, for white Europeans. We just came and we colonized and we took land and we moved into land that had been taken. Um, and so our immigration stories are very, very different. The very first laws of immigration, if you look in the Constitution, it says nothing about immigration. The Constitution talks only briefly about naturalization, and that's the part that Trump doesn't like, right, the part about birthright citizenship. Um, but it really says nothing about immigration. Um, and so folks largely immigrated unimpeded if they were from white countries. Um, and the very first immigration laws that, that regulated immigration targeted racial groups based on stereotypes. So the Chinese Exclusion Acts of the late 1800s were the very first kind of laws to, to regulate immigration. And they were all about keeping out Chinese folks who were coming to work on the railroads. Um, from there, more and more of these racially targeted laws passed. Um, and you had the first set of immigration laws in the 19, early 1900s 
um, it's the first comprehensive set of immigration laws, which was set up a quota system that provided large quotas to Western European nations. So lots and lots of folks could immigrate from those countries. And very sw small to non-existent quotas for the rest of the world, right? An immigration system explicitly at this point designed to create and maintain a, um, a white majority. The over time, that became less popular, particularly with the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And you had the, civil, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1964, which ostensibly is transitioned from a quota system to a family-based system. But if you go back and you look at the legislative history underlying that, a lot of legislators were convinced to come along because they were told that, look, the the family quota system really is the same thing as the old quota system because family immigration is going to just bring, you know, people's families come here. We're a mostly white country now. It'll be mostly white families. Don't worry. It'll maintain the same, um, the same racial makeup of the country. Um, fortunately, that is not what happened. And we have really an amazing um, amount of migration from all over the country, which I think has made the United States a much, much better, much, much better um, country, particularly if you look at recent elections where racial breakdowns come out. <laughs> um, there are some reliable voting blocks for progressive policies. Um, so that brings us today, and under Trump, you really have a return to sort of an explicit racist invocation of uh, an invocation of the immigration system as a tool um, for l returning us to really making America white again. Um, Trump and Trump's administration draws on, um, to use like <laughs> the, the language in a lot of media, racially tinged language, right? Ra racist language and stereotypes calling unaccompanied minors animals, um, referring to asylum seekers really as as the casting asylum seekers as this, this horde of individuals coming to our border to defraud our laws and to take advantage of our system. Um, this type of in imagery is, root, is, is really just leveraged against immigrants of color um, and communities of color. Um, at the outset, the, the Trump administration stated that their goal was to really deport all of what at that time was estimated to be 11 million individuals undocumented in the country. Um, to borrow from my colleague, my friend, my mentor, Stephen Manning, he sort of frames it this way. Well, how do you deport 11 million people? Um, that is one of the greatest mass movements of humanity in history, and that is you need to um, have the infrastructure to do it. And so we're seeing the growth of that physical infrastructure, detention centers, buses, so forth. Um, and you need to stigmatize that community because you don't, you can't do that to people who are like us, so they have to be otherized. And the criminal justice system and criminalization is one of the most effective ways to do that. And then you need to eliminate courts and lawyers um, because courts and lawyers really slow down the process. Am I out of time? Have I, I feel like I'm coming close on my time. Um, the Sheridan case really exemplifies a lot of that, right? So you have asylum seekers who are arrested at the border in the midst of what we now has been deemed the zero tolerance policies of Justice Sessions, where um, folks who came across the border were being charged with federal criminal offenses. Um, and folks, however, this group of folks were not. They were simply arrested at the border, not charged with any criminal charges, but moved into a federal prison. Um, this, the conditions when they were dropped in there were, were, were really awful. Um, the prison got less than 24 hours notice that they were getting 124 human beings. Um, and those asylum seekers were put into the federal detention center, which is where the pretrial um, criminal uh, detainees are being held, which at the time had about 140 people. So they nearly doubled the population. They were locking folks in cells for 23 hours a day, three people to a cell. They were um, eating next to an open toilet, many of which were broken and had problems. About 50 to 60 of the individuals who were um, dropped off there were uh, men from India that were of the Sikh religion or Sikh religion um, who were not allowed out of their cells to pray, who were, once they were, they were forced to pray in a barber shop, which they found highly offensive due to their own religious beliefs around hair. Um, it was really quite a disaster. And we brought the suit after multiple weeks 
of communicating with ICE, communicating with the Bureau of Prisons, supposedly getting cleared to come and visit, and then being told, nope, we're not going to let any immigrant, you know, any, any attorneys, any immigration attorneys in to see these folks. Because all of those folks who are in there were in sort of a fast track deportation process where if they didn't where those folks had initially said that they were afraid to return to their country, which invokes international treaties about asylum. They were all to get an interview to see whether or not what they were afraid of qualifies under asylum law, which is highly complex. Those interviews were being scheduled, and they still had not been allowed to see lawyers. And if they fail that interview, they will never see a judge. They'll never see an attorney. They'll be deported immediately. And so you had this system where they're using the prison to keep out the folks who can help bring in law um, and bring in due process in order to deport them as quickly as possible. Um, luckily, the federal courts um, agreed with us that it was unconstitutional and opened the doors and allowed attorneys in. In that time, um, there are now only two to three individuals left inside the federal prison. Nearly all of them past credible fear were found to have valid asylum claims or valid um, to be legitimate asylum seekers, have been given court dates, and then have been released all due, all, like, all by the law, right, all by the books. Um, so the Sheridan case, right, is both the negative and positives of, of kind of a lot of what we're seeing. We're seeing amazing organizing. It was community organizations came together to, to accept and, and provide support for the asylum seekers after they were released. Folks went and stayed at, um, at, at homes of community members, at churches. Um, thousands and thousands of dollars were raised by community members to provide support to the folks as they were released. Um, so it really was kind of an amazing outpouring of support. Um, I will stop there and reserve the rest for um, questions if folk ha have them. Thank you so much, uh, Leland. Um, the next speaker uh, is my sister. <laughs> Our country is really close by to one another. Shanpon Silipasais of the law firm Miranda Silipasais will now share her, her uh, perspective. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, my perspective is more of giving you guys a general overview of Immigration 101 and the complexities that we're facing in the victims' rights world. This, to me, I as just shared with our panelists, I feel as I go between anger, depression, those feelings of feeling like I should be giving up, is this fight worth it? Because things have changed so much from travel ban one, two, three, to all the, pr pretty much all the policies that have been coming down since last week. It's not just an attack on those that are coming in, trying to migrate into the United States. We are actually actively trying to deport people outside who are inside U.S. soil who have status. What I want to share with you guys is Immigration law, as Leland shared and Aaron shared, is very complex. It's the combination of our international law that also impacts our federal law, that impacts our state law, that impacts our local law. Each one of us, when we take on a case, must evaluate the life of that case as it applies to those laws and policy. It is more difficult. My husband is an immigrant. Um, tax attorney. I tell him every day how difficult my world is compared to his IRS code. <laughs> and it is really, really disheartening because a lot of people don't understand how much we've changed. Immigration law, anyone who is not a U.S. citizen is deportable. And under this administration, what he created was what's called the denaturalization task force that is outside Los Angeles, that re evaluates cases for removal and deportation, de actively trying to denaturalize U.S. citizens. And those bases are what they refer to as material fraud and misrepresentation. That is very alarming because the first group that they tackled are, is our Burmese families. 1,800 Burmese have been given notices around the United States, recalled in for interviews to be evaluated to determine whether or not they have committed material misrepresentation or fraud. Let me tell you, as a refugee who came in 1980, I don't know my real name, don't know where I was really born, and whether or not the birthday this government gave to me is really my birthday. 
May 5th, I share with my grandmother, my uncles, my cousins, my brothers. These are all dates that you see historically with all our Somali families, our refugee families. It's very systemic, right? The information that's given to us in a time of war, you don't keep, right? You're trying to protect your families. Not everybody that comes to the United States wants to stay. Let's get over that fact, right? A lot of people live in the realm of myths, what they think happens in the immigration world. If you're a green card holder, you're deportable. If you're a US citizen, you can be denaturalized, right? Then you have all of these other letters of the alphabets. My world, I deal with the U's for victims of violent crime, SIJS for children who've been abused, abandoned, neglected, the T visa for women, children, men who have been enslaved, captured, forced into commercial sex trafficking. My world is not a pretty world. And then I have all the other alphabets that I must analyze because as Aaron knows, they do what commits survival theft because their perpetrator is forcing them to prostitute or sell drugs. That is survival because their pimp is forcing them to do that or their trafficker. But they're treated as criminals, right, through a judicial system. Our systems don't always talk. And as much as we want to collaborate to make things work, my world, my advocacy for the last 20 years has been working with our federal law enforcement, our state law enforcement, our state systems, our federal systems to look at how those chain of commands and those laws and policy actually intersect to protect every individual going through that process. Because as Aaron mentioned, just because someone has a rap sheet, you must go beyond that rap sheet because that person standing before you may have been forced into slavery for the last 38 years, or a boy who was picked up in Honduras and forced to sell drugs on the street by his trafficker or his pimp. We have to evaluate our systems as how it is truly impactful in our communities. In Oregon, 10% of our families are immigrants, 10%. And I want to tell you that most of our families come from what's called mixed, mixed status families. So you may have a mom that's a US citizen, a father that's a green card holder, a child that's undocumented. We don't say the word illegal. That no one is ever illegal. Human migration is not about being illegal. It's about being undocumented. And then you have all these other folks who are in what we call pending status, like the Nicaraguans or Cubans. Because of what's happened in their home country, they have to seek protection. So they're given what's called temporary protective status inside the United States. And then we have our DACA. And I want to share with you that DACA is in a state of review. That can be taken away any time. We have a lot of DACA, 12,000, just in our metro area. We must evaluate how that will impact all of our kids. They're not kids anymore. They're some of your firefighters, they're your police officers, they're your teachers, your nurses, your lawyers. These are very important facts that we must look at, and I look forward to answering all your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shan Bund. And, um, so, Polo, I will, we would like to hear your perspective now, if you can share. Your... Um, I don't have a perspective, you know. <laughs> it's because I'm old. Uh, but um, I would just like to weave together what you've heard from this next generation of super-duper activists, folks in our communities caring for us, and I'm so grateful to all of you, not the least of which... Uh, my daughter, Chan Pun, because she and her mom cook really, really well. And, uh, <laughs> I wind up falling asleep on their couch and having breakfast. Um, except to say, you know, I'm one of those people. I, I, uh, uh, we came here when we were teenagers, and uh, South Salem High School failed me, and I failed South Salem High School. Uh, but I was, I'm an international athlete in jiu-jitsu and judo. So I became an international athlete in uh, in wrestling, in international wrestling, freestyle, and um, I was given a passport by my coach. Every time I have renewed that passport is that federal fraud that she's talking about. So all those folks who are watching this on their TVs tonight, you know, take your best shot because uh, um, 
uh, uh, people like me are like cockroaches. I mean, there's not a thing you can do. Uh, we just keep coming back. Uh, I come from a family of men who were slave labor for the Imperial Japanese Army. And, um, and uh, we're just happy to be alive every day. And we love our children, we love our grandchildren. And we're those shamelessly ambitious Americans that another kind of American seems to be afraid of. You know, maybe it's our ridiculous optimism, I'm not sure. But we laugh too much, we eat too much, we play too much, we love music, you know, we love babies and grandmas. So I, I'm, I'm not quite clear on what the problem is, but I guess I am the problem because I am, I have been committing fraud every 10 years when I've renewed my passport, knowing that I didn't, I don't properly have that first passport in the first place. I probably was not entitled, entitled to it. And this is the nature of this documentation thing. I don't know if folks have, are, are applying for Social Security. I am, and I'm 64. I'm, I need to be a lawyer to understand this, to apply for Social Security. <laughs> this is an entitlement program I've been paying into since I've been working, since I've been 16. But all oh, this is complicated, Medicare. Does anyone understand this stuff, or the state PERS system? Oh my goodness. Um, so, you know, I, I don't quite know how to, uh, uh, to humanize the complexity of these uh, legal and structural issues, these systemic institutional problems that seem to put barriers in front of folks who just love this country. When I grew up, and still today, our elders cry when they talk about Yanks. Those were skinny country boys named Stinky and Red and Dakota and Brooklyn and Detroit. And they freed our, our country from our enemy, Imperial Japan. And then they rebuilt our schoolhouse uh, to stay forever. We have a schoolhouse that keeps blowing over because we have typhoons and earthquakes and volcanoes where we come from. Uh, and this is concrete building is still there. With the leftovers, those skinny country boys built a playground for us. They treated our women with respect. They gave us chocolate bars. We love Yanks. So I don't know where this idea came from that we are somehow threatening to this way of life. Oh, no, no, we come here to shop. If you ever go to Washington Square in the weekends or her Clackamas Town Center, oh my gosh, there's not an English speaker in the mall <laughs> because they've worked so hard all week and now they're spending, spending, spending. We, we, are, we are more America, I think, than people uh, give us credit for. And we have lots of credit. Um, I think that's all I, I, I intended to say, but I just want to show my gratitude to those folks in this audience, uh, League of Women Voters. This democracy stuff rocks, you know, we love it. All over our pretty little planet, we love this, this idea that this country belongs to you, and those leaders are accountable to you. Well, anyway, a couple of years ago, so we can regain this, and this is in the country I come from will never ever happen. Congratulations to you, and thank you for giving us a new home. Thank you so much, Polo. So, um, so we have about ten, fifteen minutes uh, to see if the the speakers would like to ask each other's questions. Any questions you wanted to ask each other or bring up or anything? Right, so um, I think that, um, so now we should just uh, take the, the questions from the audiences. If anyone has any questions, anything, uh, please um, hand your, the, your questions to, to one of our volunteers there. While we're getting questions, I do want to point out that in Oregon, our statistical numbers, 37% of our immigrant families come from Mexico, about 16% come from Asia, but the surprising third is Canada with 3.9%. So we have a large Canadian population here. So when we talk about immigration, I know that this administration wants to talk about it as a brown versus white issue. It doesn't have to be that way. We're the color of the rainbow. We're here collectively, and that's how we should be thinking about it. And for the last 10 years, I've worked with, the, I've been the city of Portland's uh, immigrant integration policy advisor. I work closely with the city of Boston, 
and you should ask the people who are Irish to raise their hands on any street who are not there documented. There you go. <laughs> we have them here. Portland is now one in five foreign born. So if you look at a Starbucks line or a Safeway line, one, two, three, four, four unborn. One, two, three, four, four unborn. Half the children in our public schools go home to our homes. This is not a racial thing. It's not an ethnic thing. This is just the thing we are. And to racialize it has been characterized here to call us others is just such a strange idea. Mm -hmm. I come from a country where there's 700 languages. And if we don't speak each other's languages, if we're not eating at each other's uh, daughter's dinners, uh, weddings or graduations, children are born, funerals, birthdays, then we're not real people. We are partying with each other constantly, mm -hmm. all about food. Yes, and um, I have a first question uh, for the panels. Um, what should we do with ICE? Abolish it? Uh, reform it? What should we do? And whoever would like to um, answer this first? Mr. ACLU, I know he's itching <laughs> to get... Um, I'm going to speak from a more personal perspective rather than on behalf of the SLU. And I want to just say this. The arguments against immigration, I think, deserve a close examination, right? The arguments for a system that deports people from this country deserves a close examination. Um, you can start with the economic argument, right, that, that immigration is somehow a drain on our economy. Um, that's not true. Um, Champagne, do you have the... I actually do have the statistics for you, my friend. Hold on. How much do undocumented and immigrants pay into the um, tax I'm, system? So... Speak into the microphone, please. Can you hear me? I'm pulling up right now. I think it's like 80... Bill so million? in Oregon... 397,293 immigrants make up 10% of the population. In terms of immigrant entrepreneur, they bring 470,000 billion, 600 million dollars into our economy. I'm pulling all of it, hold on one second. The, the amount paid into taxes is it's, it's in the billions of dollars. Um, the amount paid into taxes is in the, is in the billions of dollars, and that's 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 much. Every every yes. every significant study that has looked at at this issue shows that immigrants um, and immigrant communities are a net plus on local economies on the tax tax revenue. You look at um, community safety arguments, which are one of my least favorites, um, but every again every significant study that has looked at crime patterns. Um, and that's not even accounting for the racial profiling that happens that brings communities of color into the justice system at a higher rate. Right shows that folks who are foreign born commit crimes um, at a lower rate than US citizens. And we have, the, the, the deportation system is not a community safety system. Ideally, that's our criminal justice system. So there's really no reason to use a system that actually fractures families, breaks families apart, um, deports parents of US citizens and puts US citizen children into foster care, right? Like that is not a system for community safety. Investing in a community justice system uh, that makes communities and individuals whole is, but deporta deportation is not. And so then finally you look at how much money is spent and how the resources that are spent on detaining and deporting and it's ridiculous, right? Like it's so much money and that money could be used to buttress and support communities um, and immigrant communities and all of that. So in my opinion, I, f I have a f hard time finding a single argument for deportation other than vague notions of some people deserve to be here and some people don't deserve to be here, um, which I think are problematic from the start. Thank you so much. Any comments from other in the panelists? I'm, <clears throat> I'm just really glad that somebody asked this question because it's one that I've been giving a lot of thought to, and, and I don't think I have a good answer um, quite yet. You know, abolish ICE is a great hashtag, but what, is it, what does it mean? Um, I've heard some politicians kind of talk about it. Um, what's uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, you know, 
she kind of, <clears throat> she kind of ran on an abolish ICE. Not wasn't her only um, issue, but she would say that. And and when she explains it, she really did have a nuanced perspective of it. And she said, "Well, you know what I mean is let's abolish the system as as we know it. This ICE as a as an agency, right, is actually a relatively new government agency. It was only formed after." 9-11 um, when it used to be the INS and then it broke up into ICE and Customs and CBP, Customs and Border Protection and all these different agencies. And so some people, I think, do you understand the bigger picture behind it and it's not just kind of abolish, abolish ICE and, and do away with um, everything. That doesn't mean I, I don't think we should do away with deportation. We can find other ways. What I struggle with, what, what I'm thinking about lately and why I haven't come to a real strong opinion yet is it's it's hard for me to really um, like, <clears throat> like I I have concerns about a social movement that's only based on kind of being against something instead of kind of articulating of, of value um, and so that's that's where I more, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think there might be a better way for us to frame it because, and, and I was recently talking with some colleagues who I deeply respect and are incredibly smart people, and they are all about abolish ICE and they're immigration attorneys. Um, and they're and, and I understood they were talking about, you know, we need to act as abolitionists. We need to be as fierce as the abolitionists, and that needs to be our. Um, our, M our MO, like that's how we work. And I get that, but then I think, um, you know, when, if we talk about abolitionists and you're thinking about the abolition of slavery, and we get rid of slavery and it was just replaced, right, with Jim Crow, and it was just replaced with all these other things. Um, and so I, I worry that just focusing on abolishing one thing and thinking that's the end product um, isn't gonna really get us where we wanna go. And I worry that when people say things like abolish ICE, like if we just get rid of it, our problems will be solved. Those, I worry that that, um, people just kind of, um, it almost sounds a little lazy to me, like you don't really want to do the work, <laughs> the work of it, you just want to get rid of something. Um, but again, I'm, these are just kind of my, my thought process recently in trying to figure out where I land on this. And like so many other terms regard, associated with immigration that we hear in the news today, like um, what it really means, we're all kind of talking about different things. Um, so, so I don't, I don't know. I, I'm definitely am, um, not okay with the ISIS culture and, and where it's going. But yeah, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron. Go to it, go, go yes. Con su permiso. I have an idea on this. Um, um, what I tried to express in uh, in the Jatun uh, Krochong uh, was that things move freely around our planet, whether it's whales or caribou, monarch butterflies, and Chapman Elementary Swifts, but so do ideas and money and products. They, these things move in an, an amazing and important way around our planet. Products, ideas, money. With the press of a button, you can send money across we all do. We all send monies back to our families back home, electronically, in little digits. But why is it that people moving is so difficult? And I would suggest that's because people are easier to control. And that our leaders get us into thinking that those people or those people need to be controlled better than they are. That they're bringing something evil or something that's contrary to our values. Money moves in a moment. Products move by the shiploads. You can watch them here at the confluence of rivers Willamette and Columbia. You know, at the port, it's beautiful the way products move and the way ideas move, whether it's Christian ideas or Muslim ideas, the ideas of, uh, of Silicon Valley. Wonderful. But people moving is an opportunity for us to keep each other captive. And I find that so painful to explain. So I'm not for the idea of erasing national boundaries. Implicit in, the, in national sovereignty is controlling who is your, in your country. Citizenship is, is natural to sovereignty. It's fundamental to sovereignty. American Indian nations get to determine who's in, the, who's in your nation, uh, who's in your tribe, and who's not. 
So that's important, but I think what we're looking for is some way to strategically manage the movement of people, the movement of labor, the movement of consumers, the movement of families in the same way that we manage the movement of money or the movement of Toyotas or Samsung uh, or apples. These are not made in America, by the way. These are made in China. Yeah. And that's, that's where, where uh, I think we're just as capable of managing that in a, in a creative and kind way, moving people and, and uh, making sure the labor forces are here so that our uh, uh, people coming up from the South to work so hard without protection of law is taken care of. And actually, if you give me a chance to go back home, um, I'm there. Okay, thank you so much, Polo. Can I um, add to uh, just what Leland said? I just wanted to make sure you guys got the right numbers. I finally found it. Undocumented immigrants in Oregon paid $80.8 million in state taxes in 2014. DACA recipients estimated was $20 million. And immigrant-led households was $1.7 billion. So just to give you an idea of the financial impact. For me, I am all for immigration reform. We have not reformed immigration laws since 1952. It's time to realize that our systems are broken. Families should not have to wait 40 years to be reunited. This is ridiculous, in my opinion. Wow, well, you, you just asked, answered the question that we were about to ask you. Oh. So thank you so much. So we have, um, um, will the remaining field in Sheridan's be released? Mm. We hope so. The, the folks that are in Sheridan um, all have um, asylum hearings coming up very soon and we're hoping that they win those asylum hearings and once they win those asylum hearings they will be released. Um, ICE could release the remaining three, they have just chosen not to. Thank you so much. And we, we have time, just only few, a few questions. So um, do you believe that we will be able to stop the separation of parents and children at the border. Who would like to answer this question is? As a mother, I want to say yes. As an attorney, I'll let you know that it's gonna be, as a mother, I want to say yes, because I would hope and pray that every child will not be separated from their parents. We witnessed firsthand the agony of a father looking for his child, where he did not see for months during the separation, and not even knowing where he was at in Oregon. But as an attorney, I will tell you that we up here are in for a long fight. And the rules of law is very gray. And the tax on our laws, the challenges to our laws are on so many level when we're talking about creating policies that can be changed by this administration and actual laws that are in place by our codes, our federal codes that we must abide by. There's a lot that's in between that is being challenged by this administration. Anyone want to follow up on that? I mean, I think just to put a, a little bit into context really what was happening at the border um, with the, the family separation. And as an initial matter, families have been separated at the border for a long time in various ways. We, we really saw that, um, that serious and chaotic situation of family separation after there was the zero tolerance policy. And, and so what was really happening was a former attorney general sessions that, you know, we're going to have this zero tolerance policy for people who are trying to enter the United States unlawfully. Um, illegal entry, entering unlawfully is a federal misdemeanor. It's kind of, it's like the lowest misdemeanor. It's like the equivalent of reckless, uh, not even reckless, like 
a parking ticket or something um, in other law, but we're going to criminally prosecute that. And so once you put someone into criminal proceedings, your child can't be with you, and that's really what was causing the family separation was this criminal prosecution at the border. And that has slowed down, but of course what we're seeing it being replaced with and we're seeing more detention centers being built for families. Um, and I would just say that the family detention is not an okay alternative to family separation. Um, we've, we saw that um, along the border a few years ago in Artesia, and we have a lot of folks who've done good work here um, on that issue. So I think that the, the really chaotic family separation that we are seeing, um, obviously there was a lot of lawsuits and, and that kind of the big newsy piece slowed down, but families continue to be separated, and if they're not separated, they're often detained um, in, in pretty terrible conditions. Um, so even if family separation ends, it's just family detention is, is not the, the right alternative, in my opinion. Okay, thank you so Can much. Can I just also follow up that with family separation, when they take the kids away, Oftentimes, the kid becomes um, custody of Office of Refugee Resettlement. Mm -hmm. So their track is a little bit more complicated than their parents. And so under the world of immigration, that's really confusing. And once they come back together, if they can find each other, you still have the difficulty of sh changing that. And so the challenges are not just in our family setting, but in how they are placed, whether there's guardianship, foster care, all these other factors that are involved as well. And just to two last points. One is that the ACLU National filed a lawsuit called Ms. L, um, which challenged the, the, the practice of separating families really as a deterrent. So mm -hmm. while it, it arises from this, these criminal charges and the criminal process, um, we do know from just policy discussions and statements that, that the Trump administration and, and the white nationalist hardliners that have been brought in have, have been looking at forced family separation at the border as one of these potential deterrents, right? We'll make conditions so awful that folks will, won't come here. Um, but I also, right, so ACLU filed this lawsuit and under the lawsuit they're supposed to have stopped that and have been re, re finding and reuniting the families, which I mean, I think there's a couple of hundred children who still haven't been reunited with their parents. Um, so in, in, in a sense, it's stopped. But in another sense, what it, you know, that lawsuit is in process. And let's all just cross our fingers that there, it becomes permanently found unconstitutional. Um, but I think what Aaron, to Aaron's point, right, like that was a tool that is that, did, that already existed, right? Like family separation is an integral part of our criminal justice system that is so routine that we don't even see it, right? That, that mothers and fathers get sent away for decades in prison, sometimes over nonviolent, and frequently over the last 20 years, nonviolent offenses. And they have been separated from their family members. And so this was an example, right? Using the f enforcement of federal laws against immigration at the border became an easy way to whole, right, implement the system. They didn't have to create a system of family separation. They just had to move folks into the criminal justice system. And so that's a way that I think liberal politicians, Democrats in particular, have um, ceded this territory. We've allowed inhumane and, inhumane and dehumanizing practices to become so routine in the criminal justice system that all it takes is moving an immigrant community into the criminal justice space and all of these things that we've accepted for so long just become part of the immigration system. And once they kind of pop out of the criminal justice system, like we saw with zero tolerance, it becomes shocking. But these practices have been going on. So my point really is just that. Like so many of the things that we see that are offensive in, in our immigration system that we're starting to come to light um, really have been going on against other communities as well for quite a long while. Wow. And uh, we have, I think it's our last questions that, um, so how do we engage the next generation of activists? Tell us what we could do. Well, there's someone in the audience, Carol. Um, 
uh, who has, uh, uh, folks, this is Carol over here. She is, uh, she's a mentor to uh, um, some we call Binti Manis. Uh, Saya is, in our language, it means dear daughter. Uh, we have a generation of young women. I, I cannot comment on the fellows and what the heck's going on with them and where they are. But we have a generation of young women who are just um, so bright and brave and beautiful going to universities, going to graduate schools, going to law schools and the like. And what Carol has done is taken one of these daughters of ours, she's Rohingya, and uh, from a deeply wounded family, uh, absent father, and she's the mom at home taking care of her mom and her younger brothers and going to PSU, she's just graduating. And she needs to go to law school after she finishes her master's degree in counseling because I'm not allowing her to date or anything like that in the, until she's in her 30s. <laughs> right? Something like that. We're working this out. But I think what I'm trying to say is Americans have so much. And she has you know, this sort of power of an anti-mentor. Right? Uh, our daughters listen to her because she knows America really, really well. We want to adjust and adapt to America really, really well, but we really need to reach outside of our families, outside of our especially enclave ethnic streams, to learn these things. And so she has given her love, her time, her money. I think you worked out with her today. Did you go running or do yoga? Yeah. Tough love. Let's see. Yeah, her mom cooks real well. I agree with you. <laughs> but, uh, we're all about eating. But I just want to say that sometimes Americans don't know how much they have, how wealthy you are, and how much you know that we simply don't. We, you know, I'm the first boy to finish. Uh, well, I didn't finish high school, but I did graduate from university. So you know, in our family, we have no idea of what that means to show up at PSU. And Carol has been kind enough to take care of our daughter, get her into the right classes, make her work out so she doesn't beat up her baby brothers, making her healthy and happy. And I think in there, in us being familiar to each other, we call her auntie, that's, that's the cure. Well, thank you so much uh, for um, all those uh, excellent questions that uh, we have here. So uh, we would like now to ask our panelists to leave us with some closing thoughts. So we uh, have about three minutes for each of you to um, have us uh, bring something home with us uh, from our discussion tonight. Thank you. And whoever would like to start first. I'll go. I want you guys, hopefully leaving here, to feel that you've got some knowledge. I want you to hopefully focus, don't go big, focus small. The conversation about immigration is a very personal conversation. Have those conversations at home. Look at where you may be working or where you're volunteering. If the place where you're working or volunteering at has policies that impact our communities, but it doesn't take the impact of our legal permanent residents, our US citizens, our undocumented, on those in between as equals, reevaluate how those policies actually impact our communities. That would be my one request for all of you. And if I could ask folks to be like Carol, um, that and, and the other Carol, Carol Matsuo, she also who uh, was, uh, she's, this, uh, she's uh, Ohana Kamaina from Hawaii. And when I came to Portland, she started introducing me to, to Islander people here. And it's this, it's this family thing that makes us how we are and who we are. You know, we know how to work hard. We'll make enough money. Don't worry about that. You know, we'll have mortgages whether we have documents to be in America or not pretty soon. Because we have to have a home to raise your children or your wife won't love you anymore. I'm talking like a fellow, OK? So women, I'm sorry. But this is how us men are. We're rather practical. So it takes folks like this to take us into their worlds and introduce us to worlds we just simply don't know. If you are in faith associations or civic associations, allow us to introduce you to people. We have 100 mutual assistance associations in Portland. These are, you know, whether they're Lao or Indonesian or Thai 
or Mexican or Guatemalan. These are fam these are communally based organizations with elder aunties and big uncles sort of taking care of business for everybody. We all have these teenage boys who are just clueless fellas, all three of you. And we have these young women who are just ready to rock and roll because they're set free all of a sudden. And we're encouraging them to be educated, get a driver's license. If you would like to mentor these kind of young people, we, you, we will be so proud of them, I promise you. I promise you. Leland. I think along the themes of what I was talking about, I think it's important to understand, right, we're, we're living through an unprecedented attack on our immigrant communities. Um, and it's really like we could do an hour long panel discussing each and every one of the ways this government is going about systematically dismantling both the, you know, the legal systems meant to preserve some modicum of due process, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of things that we can do. I think the first thing is, right, like paying attention. Um, and, you know, Polo and Champone have, have really hit some important points and um, said a lot of really important stuff tonight. I don't have a lot to add, but I will just say, like, from my perspective, which arises really out of that intersection, is that understanding, right, that the way that we allow criminalization to dehumanize is a tool that impacts so many communities and it is really potently impacting our immigrant community. And so I think we really need to be cautious, right? Like when the Oregonian runs a story about some salacious crime and that crime is committed by an immigrant and the first 14 paragraphs of that article are discussing immigration, we have to ask ourselves, why is this crime being treated so differently than any other? Well, it's because of the race and because of the immigration status of the person. That kind of stuff is really, really dangerous. Um, but again, it arises out of a space where criminalization is allowed to strip people of their rights and their humanity. It's, it's complex, right, because crimes often cause harm, and harm, the way that we approach harm as a society is through punishment and incarceration, and there are better models. Um, but just my, my, my suggestion would be that. Be aware of the way that, 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 that dehumanization and criminalization show up as, as potent tools um, because they are being used against immigrants um, because immigrants often find themselves in one of the least stable places constitutionally and within our laws that it's very easy to try um, very constitutionally risky attacks on those folks that we later see imported to other parts of our um, governance. So I think that would be what I would just ask. Yeah, yeah right on. <laughs> um, I, I, totally agree with and respect all of my colleagues' sentiments at the table. Um, I think um, I'll, I'll try to to leave you maybe with some more tangible, practical things that you can take away from this evening because it, it is really overwhelming, right? Immigration, you know, I focus on crimmigration. It's just one little piece and there's asylum and there's all of these issues and it's so overwhelming and it's federal law um, so I don't think I need to tell this crowd to go out and vote or to contact your representatives I think you y'all have that covered um, but I would say that there are a lot of um, local policies that affect immigration and affect everything that we've spoken about tonight um, for example, um, local law enforcement agencies and sheriff's departments, their relationships with ICE, their communications with ICE, the Department of Corrections and their communications with ICE, um, the DAs that you elect, what are their stances? Um, sheriffs, I think that's um, a big one. If you can vote for your sheriff and, and, and finding out where they stand on um, cooperating with ICE and sharing information. Um, Leland mentioned the, you know, an ICE contract um, you know, <clears throat> for juveniles being held here is ICE contract at NORCOR. Um, you know, those are all local things. At, to explain that, NORCOR is a, a local um, 
state correctional facility that ICE rents beds from, a certain amount of beds, and so that's a contract that they're making money from. Um, and, and, and I think that that's wrong. I don't, I don't think we should be profiting off the uh, detention of human beings. Um, and so that's a local policy, that's a local issue that you could, you could advocate for and, and educate yourself on. Um, and I hope that you continue to stay engaged in these issues. Like immigration, I know, is, is the hot topic. I mean, I've never been more popular as an immigration lawyer than, <laughs> than, I, than in the age of, of Trump when it's, it's in the news every day. Um, but we've, all of us at this table have been fighting this fight for a long time, and we're going to keep fighting it even after it seems like things have settled down. So even if the crazy, salacious news stories aren't there anymore, um, it's going to take a lot of work to really, really um, affect the kind of change that we want to see. And so um, I guess that'll be my final parting thought is to always remember um, you know, to distinguish between kind of the rhetoric of immigrant justice and sanctuary and, and activism from the actual work of it and just kind of figuring out um, what little lever is just within your reach uh, to help make a little bit of movement on it. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, uh, panels, for helping us complicate um, our understanding of immigration and to think about the opportunities and challenges that are ahead of us. Um, please uh, look on the website of the League of Women Voters of Portland, um, lwvpdx.org, to find the Metro East YouTube recording of this program, which you can view online. Thank you to our donors, the Manuma Bar Foundation, the Carol and Selma Selling Foundation, and Metro East Community Media for their support of this program. Thanks to Manuma County for the use of this space and to our audiences and volunteers. So this has been a production of Metro East Community Media and a presentation of the League of Women Voters and Portland Education Fund. So this concludes uh, the record part of our panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, panel.